this whole idea that we're coming to the, the limits of the resources of the planet, the ability of the planet to support us, is very much in people's thinking. It's amazing to, to hear scientists say that without us meeting the challenge of sustainability in this century, we may not even make it through the century, and we're 15 years into that century. I want humans who can use that which they need, but no more. I want to see humans able to be responsible and thereby protect the resources so that the world around them is a strong and healthy world that can endure into future generations. We're sort of at a, at a crossroads here as to where we go in the future. I mean, we start talking about nine and a half billion people on this planet here in the next 40 years. We need to make some decisions and we need to make them relatively quickly. I think we don't even fully appreciate all the aspects in which sustainability intersects our daily lives. And think about what's gonna happen with how you live your life and how it's gonna impact the next generations. If I'd ask 10 different people what the meaning of sustainability is, you'll get 10 different answers. People are going to come at it from different points of view. The ability to continue what we're doing over the long haul. Using it in a way that protects the world doesn't have a negative impact. Work like nature. Relationships are healthy between things. And not become degraded. Allowing things to maintain the same quality over time. And thinking for the human race 100, 200, 500 years down the line. Not just for humanity's sake, but for all those other life forms as well. As we think about sustainability in the 21st century, we need to remember that this is not a new issue. This dates back generations, basically eons. As early as the 1930s, Aldo Leopold wrote that the oldest task in human history is to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. Seeing the impact of the Dust Bowl and the drought and what human beings could do to, to degrade the landscape and, and hurt their own economies, their own livelihoods, that was deeply troubling to him and that was part of the impetus to write his book. It was back in the 1940s when Aldo Leopold wrote, we abuse land because we see it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. So Aldo Leopold, he didn't talk about sustainability, using that terminology, but really what he was talking about with the land ethic is protecting the land, understanding our stewardship obligations to the land for our sake and for the sake of the ecosystem on which we depend. When Leopold was writing the Sand County Almanac, we have to remember the world looked a lot different. There were only a couple of billion people at that time. Now we're approaching eight billion people. But people had a much closer connection to the land than they do now. Most of the population in the United States were farmers or lived in the rural landscape. So they truly did rely on the land for their sustenance and for their livelihood. When Aldo Leopold wrote about this area, things were clearly out of balance. Uh, at the time of settlement, this was a tall grass prairie and oak savanna. But after agriculture became the industry in the late 1800s, uh, things started to happen. The technology that the farmers brought with them from Northern Europe, while perfectly appropriate for Northern Europe, were not sustainable here in Southwest Wisconsin. And so within a relatively short time, uh, massive amounts of soil erosion occurred because of overgrazing on the hillsides and up and down uh, row cropping on the, on the ridge tops and on the bottoms. After all, Wisconsin was a huge wheat producer way, way back in the 1800s. And the Europeans were the ones that brought that here. In Europe, that is not a problem because they have very gentle, steady rains. Over here, that same production model was just a killer on our soils. If that wheat weren't up to hold the soil and a two inch rain came, which is not unusual in our area, they had huge erosion. They looked at this erosion not as a loss of soil, but they looked at it as a ditch creator around which it was very difficult to farm. 
you're looking at 12 to 15 feet of sediment that eroded off the hillsides and filled in the valley floor. Virtually all of the ground on both sides of this stream bank is topsoil that 200 years ago was up on a ridge top. And they eroded the soil and the system was on the brink of failure when the University of Wisconsin system said, hey, we need to help this state and the farmers in the state find new approaches to agriculture and dairy was one of the principal elements of that. Before World War II, Wisconsin was dotted with many small farms and 40, 50 acres was a fairly normal farm and uh, make a living off the land. Well, after World War II, when we changed how we did agriculture, we got more into chemical farming and then the idea to get into bigger farming. Uh, in the 70s, Earl Butts, secretary for under the Richard Nixon administration, uh, suggested that either get big or get out. And uh, that was pretty much the death knell for the small time dairy farmers in the state of Wisconsin. We saw dairy herd sizes going from average of 20s to 60s to 80s. Now, 400 is by no means uncommon, and we have a couple hundred operations that get into that 1,000 plus range. And so the small time dairy farmer uh, has been pretty much wiped out in the state. So really in agriculture, sustainability is, is still evolving. As long as human beings have lived on planet Earth, we have impacted our environment. And that's the way it'll always be. As human technology has increased and, our, and the human population has increased, the, the impact on natural systems has increased. We are of the natural world. We exist within a priory of species, within the web of life, and if we have things collapse around us, we are going to be hurt by that. And that our race is tied into nature through the soil, through the animals, through the whole biology of the earth. And people have grabbed on to the concept of sustainability. The idea of sustainability has risen to such prominence because we are at, many would argue, a tipping point. We're at the limits of some of our environmental resources in terms of good air, water, soil quality, and the way we've been degrading what's going to allow us to continue to survive. But we haven't looked to the future generations. We've been doing everything, I think, pretty short-sightedly in terms of how we interact with the, with the planet. I don't think any of us can predict whether or not we have enough resources to sustain that many people or whether the next natural disaster might be something that's really catastrophic and that we can or can't recover from. So unfortunately, I think we'll have to see more of the effects of uh, the lack of sustainability in order for us to really start taking sustainability more seriously comes down to really caring. If there's enough caring about the quality of shared assets, of shared well-being, things work. Once we break down and stop focusing on that sharing, then even the quality of our own personal lives starts to be impacted. I would argue that sustainability is incredibly important to direct human health impacts on, on our current health, our future health, our next generation's health. And ultimately, if you don't have health, you don't have much of anything else. something for you to think about. You know, the food that you choose to buy today and eat today, you know, will become the cells of your body tomorrow. 
people are starting to pay attention to where their food comes from. They want to have good quality food. They don't want to have all the pesticides, herbicides. They don't want to have antibiotics. They don't have some of the issues that are really starting to cause some concerns. And there's no question, there's very clearly documented research demonstrating that the quality of our food has a big impact upon our health. They did a study that looked at newborns, and they did cord blood, which, you know, the first blood that comes out of the umbilical cord. And somewhere around 400 chemicals were in an infant be right at, at the time of birth. That meant they were chemicals that came through the placenta from the mother. Although it's not been proven, I think one of the big suspicions about neurodevelopmental disorders in kids has to do with the body burden of chemicals that our kids are born with. And, you know, it continues with our food sources. They did a great study on kids where they looked at pesticide residue in the urine. Then all the kids' pesticide levels in their urine dropped when they were eating organic fruits and vegetables. Do we know which pesticides are bad for kids? No, but we do know that pesticides are known endocrine disruptors. We think that they probably have an effect on the neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and attention deficit disorder. We know that pesticides increase your risk of cancer. The truth is that choices people make about what they eat can have a positive impact on their health and a positive impact on their pocketbook. We have 40 known essential vitamins and minerals that we have to get from the food. We've identified over 8,000 phytochemicals that exist in the fruits and vegetables. One of the best ways we can describe phytochemicals is they give the color to all the fruits and vegetables you eat. Phyto means plant. Chemical means something a plant synthesizes, and plants synthesize all sorts of substances to help that plant grow and ward off insect attack and so forth. And when we eat those fruits and vegetables and we consume those phytochemicals, they have numerous health benefits. Uh, some phytochemicals are being studied for their anti-cancer effect, for their effects against cardiovascular disease. Uh, the list goes on and on and on and it's in the importance of phytochemicals. If livestock are eating the grasses, they're going to also accumulate some of those phytochemicals in then the meat products and the milk and the egg products we eat from them, and that's a good thing. But then the other big thing for livestock, organically or sustainably grass-grazed versus conventionally grain-fed, is the fat profile. And I came out of a lipid lab from the University of California, a fat lab, we called it. For a long time, many of us thought of fat as just as one thing and one bad thing. And in fact, fat is not one thing. There's several types of fats. So there's omega-3 and omega-6. Our ancestors consumed anywhere from about a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, or maybe a four-to-one for most of human history. So if you look at the American ratio now, instead of one-to-one, two-to-one, four-to-one, 10-to-one to 20-30-to-one. To and that appears to be a problem in terms of human health. Long story short, getting more omega-3 in our diet, bringing omega-6 down, is clearly advantageous in terms of lowering our risk to heart disease. So we want more omega-3. How are you going to do that with our food? since about the 1940s, how we raise our livestock, what we feed them, has really changed the fat profile in that livestock. We've gone heavily to grain feeding and conventional operations, and the two biggest components there would be corn and soy. The fat in those, the oils in those, are 50, 60, 70 times more omega-6 than omega-3. And cows are what they eat, we are what we eat. And so we change that omega-6 and omega-3 profile of the, the cow or the chicken. Uh, so we get a whole more omega-6, much less omega-3. And grasses contain relatively more equal amounts of omega-6 and omega-3. And so when we do the analyses on a milk or a meat or a cheese sample from cows grass graze, quite consistently that product from that cow is, is higher in omega-3. And the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in that is a healthier ratio relative to what we understand. It's one of the places where we've really disrupted the kinds of fats that we're taking in and we, we've, we've pushed them in a ratio that is not healthful. All of that is also causing a shift towards sustainable farming practices. Agriculture is at a turning point right now. With regard to sustainability, because it affects the food we eat, 
how it shapes our water resources. Alters uh, landscapes and ecosystems. The water we drink. Wildlife. Soil health. Community life. It's all of the things that make up our environment and the health of our environment. The minute that we started agriculture with our human race, which was about 10,000 years ago, we became, by definition, unsustainable. And the reason is that we were moving minerals and nutrients out of the soil into food and sending it someplace else to be consumed, and the nutrients ended up in that place. When people talk about sustainable agriculture, they're talking about agriculture that does not contribute too much greenhouse gas, that does not pollute the soil, does not pollute the air, and does not pollute the water to an undue extent compared to other industries and human activities. When farmers are weighing the three cornerstones of sustainable agriculture, environmentally sound, profitable, socially responsible, the right balance depends on who you talk to. If you're not making any money, then you can't afford to do the other two. So it has to be profitable at the end of the day. Uh, you have to take care of the environment because that's what we live on. Our land that we feed our animals with is exactly what we need to be passed down. That, that cow won't be here tomorrow. It's going to be the land that's here that we feed the cows with. And socially acceptable because at the end of the day we need customers. People need to buy our product and if they don't accept what we're selling and how we're doing it then it's not sustainable. You have to be profitable enough to make the right choices. The right choices allow you to be environmentally sensitive and socially sensitive. Obviously we don't want to be hurting our neighbors or our employees. We don't want to be hurting the birds and the bees and the fish. The economics have to work. If, if you're struggling economically, you can't make the right choices for social and environmental issues. The environmental portion, the economic portion, and the social portion can exist independently of each other for a short time, but over the long time, they are entirely intertwined. If one starts to fail, the other degrades. We tend to think that they're standalone and that they might even be competitive with one another but in the long run, they're synergistic. And that's the interesting thing, to imagine that they are synergistic. When one flourishes, the others are enhanced. And so you can't really separate one from the other. It's all connected. It's sort of like a body. It's like saying, could your body function without a liver? Or could your body function well without a lung? Well, no, it can't. It's all tied together. It's all part of the system, and I think that's Part of the problem is we have a tendency to look at things in pieces and not necessarily as a whole. Perhaps the biggest chunk of sustainable agriculture is sustainable water. Sustainable water use in concert with healthy lakes and streams and sustainable water quality good enough for people and fish and wildlife. High water quality and all the benefits that brings in terms of tourism, recreation, economic prosperity to communities is just as important as other land uses within that watershed that are impacting that water quality. See that rain cloud over there? That's gonna bring us clean water. It's a bit of a double-edged sword because while it still replenishes our groundwater, uh, replenishes our lakes and our streams, it grows our crops, it waters us, it waters our animals, it's also the thing that can also take soil along with it and bring phosphorus along with it. It's just a fact that the way we grow food now has a very heavy footprint on our lakes, streams, and, and groundwater. That was not the case 60 or 75 years ago because we didn't have the, the technology, the industrialized fertilizer, the food additives for crops. We didn't even have the capability to have a concentrated animal feeding unit. 
and now we do. And so we have connected water to agriculture in a new way that is leading to a tremendous amount of damage to our water resources. Look at this huge body of water that we've got here, and people take it for granted that it's, it's endless. We, we live on the Great Lakes. There's so much water here. But now we're recognizing that it, it's not endless. It's, it's the resident time of, of what we put into this lake is, is a long time, 100 years, I hear, that it takes for what we put into this system before it exits Lake Michigan. This body of water here is the source of drinking water for so many people around the Great Lakes, including the city of Green Bay and the suburbs. I think the average person isn't really aware of the problems we've got in the Fox River and Green Bay. But this is a really important issue. Drinking water, that's right at the top of my list. Without that, uh, what do you got? There's tremendous nutrient flow from the Fox Valley that comes into Green Bay, and Green Bay is a somewhat confined region of Lake Michigan. As those nutrients come out of the Fox estuary, they don't mix into the lake. They don't get diluted right away. So Green Bay is definitely a pocket that's susceptible to pollution. So the, the bay is really a reflection of what's happening in this watershed. By the 1970s, we had pretty much cleaned up the human sewage problem, but the runoff from agriculture had more than replaced it. So the sources of phosphorus are either fertilizers or uh, manures primarily. There are some natural phosphorus, but again, most of it's coming in from manure and fertilizers. And when we have high phosphorus in the soil, it's vulnerable to loss. Phosphorus tends to stay connected to the soil particles and the organic matter the most, not real soluble, but when we have excess in the soil or when we lose that soil from the landscape through erosion, then the phosphorus gets into the water. We know that much of what runs off the landscape happens in just a relatively few days a year when we have larger rainstorms. That's also when most of the phosphorus or products that come from animal waste or from other fertilizers and from soil get off the landscape and get into the water. Uh, what's going on in the bottom in Green Bay is really important, uh, especially when it comes to dissolved oxygen. And you may have heard about the hypoxic zone or the, what they call a dead zone. It's a, an area, the bottom water, which has very low and sometimes zero dissolved oxygen. And so that's tough on organisms. Uh, and so that's a, that's, a, that's a problem in Green Bay. It's a problem in Lake Erie. It's a problem in the Gulf of Mexico. There are probably hundreds of hypoxic zones around the world, all driven pretty much by the same problem, and that is you know, excessive nutrient loading or phosphorus and nitrogen coming in from the landscape. And the reason that's important is because while there's a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, there isn't much in the water. So there's much less of it available for breathing, for life underwater. The main issue is the supply of nutrients and that phosphorus feeds a lot of um, algal growth and phytoplankton growth in the bay. When all those algae and phytoplankton die, the bacteria that degrade that new fresh organic matter, they breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2. And what that means then is that there's just less oxygen available for the life that needs it. This is a non-nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria. The toxin that it produces, produces a microcystin. It's a liver toxin, yeah, which makes water undrinkable, unpalatable. The citizens of Green Bay haven't gotten their water from Green Bay for a long time. So it's not directly a drinking water issue for the citizens of Green Bay but it's still a, a water quality problem. One of the problems I think we face here is people take water for granted. These lakes are simply a reflection of what happens on the land. For all intents and purposes, anything you throw, toss, leak, or let get into the system, it goes in today, there's a good chance you will drink it tomorrow, if not tomorrow, sometime in the future. Because right now, the environment subsidizes most of our activities. We do not pay for dumping stuff in the lake. We use that as a, a repository for our waste, and that's not right. We can't continue to do that. It's not a sustainable activity. 
You know, somebody said the future has no constituency, and that is so true. Your great-great-grandchildren can't come back to you and say, why didn't you do X, Y, and Z? They, they don't have a voice today. It is, it is totally up to us. It took us three years in Green Bay working with scientists and people who had studied water to actually answer the question, could we clean it up? And then we had to figure out, well, how do we get people to do that? And that's the challenge. We're into now a couple decades of effort to try to see if people can make the changes that are required. We know what those changes are. The challenge will be, can we get everybody to collaborate again to do those changes? The interesting thing about sustainable agriculture was that all over the country, communities of farmers began responding to the same set of concerns and wanting to accomplish the same things. Environmentally sound, profitable, socially responsible agriculture, because they were losing ground economically. And they were concerned about their impact on water quality and soil erosion. And so farmers wanted to do the right thing. Farmers genuinely have a passion for caring for the land. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. You know, being a farmer is a lot of work, no matter which way you look at it. Our survival depends on the land being able to produce. So if we don't take care of it and it degrades in one way or another, that land will not be able to produce and the farm will no longer be profitable. And in a sense, you lose the farm. <laughs> All farmers want to be good environmental students. Uh, many of them are living on land that their fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers lived. So the understanding and the paradigm shift, it's not to disparage organic versus conventional, but the paradigm shift needs to be that this is about going forward. Using some of the best that we have, that we've ever learned, that we've ever invented, that we've ever utilized, and applying it along with the best farmers that we have. This country has the best farmers in the world. So applying technology won't go away just because you're going from conventional to organic or applying these, these more sustainable farming practices. They'll only expand. You'll only find new ways to use them. And that should be the excitement and the challenge. And if that's all done on the foundational principle that you take a benchmark of where your farm is now and your soil's health on your farm right now, and you look to improve that as well as improve yields and gain and everything else, then you'll know the difference between wanting to be more sustainable and being more sustainable. Wherever you practice agriculture on this planet, the primary condition that you're concerned about is the soil. So the type of soil, the depth of soil, the slope, all have an enormous amount to do with the way that you manage that land in order to maintain the health of the soil, the sustainability of the soil, the ability of the soil to continue to produce crops and food. Soil. 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 And it always comes back to protect that soil because the health of our soil basically reflects the health of our plants and the productivity of our plants and our forages, which directly relates to the health of our cows. And if all of that is in balance, we've got a very environmentally and an economically sustainable operation. So all of these mines are coming together and what they're all realizing independently is that the soil has a tremendous role in correcting each individual issue and the intersection for all of these areas, whether it's climate change, whether it's human health, whether it's animal health, environmental health, and the one intersecting point, the one dot that all the lines cross through is the soil. The other non-sustainable issue, it's soil. We are losing soil to grow crops in at a fairly high rate. It takes 100 years to build an inch of soil. This is science. As we erode these soils away, you suddenly have five or six inches of soil that can be lost over 100 years and only one inch will be replaced. And so this may not seem very severe to somebody who's 60, 70 years old, but it is gonna be severe for their offspring's offspring's offspring. There's scientists around the world that are looking at the fact that in some parts of the world there's, there's only about 60 years worth of topsoil left. And in some parts of the country, even in North America, we have soils that are so degraded that the farmers are not actually farming on topsoil anymore, they're farming the subsoil, the soil that was below the topsoil. 
we can lose an incredible amount of soil if we do not protect it. And if we lose our soil, we lose our farm. We've all seen the phenomenon of these intense rains. We're standing here in a day where we just got a two inch rain north of here in less than an hour. They're serious. And the only way that keeps soil on the ground during these rain events is permanent ground cover. One of the biggest things is to keep it where it is. It needs to be underneath the roots and underneath our plants in order for them to grow. And that's how we continue to increase the organic matter on our farm and in our soils. We can't afford runoff. We can't afford soil erosion. When you talk about soil health, organic matter or the organic content in soil, you know, is one of the key indicators and it's huge. Organic matter is where the nutrients are stored. Organic matter is where the beneficial biology is housed. It holds two and a half to three times its weight in water. So it's also where we can mitigate stormwater runoff and also store water in fields instead of having it run off, which benefits both the environment and the neighbors around the farm as well as the farm. For every 1%, we can raise a farm field or soils organic matter for every 1% we can store an additional 16,500 gallons of water per acre, but it also is gonna help keep groundwater clean and surface water clean. The organic matter in soil is the sponge. So if you hold it uh, and it doesn't run away, it doesn't take the valuable soil, the valuable topsoil itself with it, and it doesn't take the nutrients with it. By increasing the organic matter, you know, that's, gonna, that's not only going to have the biology that's going to naturally cycle the nitrogen and other nutrients from the atmosphere, but it's going to hold on to any of those inputs that you apply, whether it's manures, organic, or conventional fertilizers. Organic matter is a part of life. It's a continuum of the circle of life. Organic matter is nothing more than living and dead matter in the soil that's contributing to the mineral elements, the water, the air, that's where the essence of life is really being formed, where you take the photosynthesis, the sun energy, and some miracle happens in that soil. And it's, it's actually in, enhanced by the organic matter so that it multiplies. So when we discount that organic matter level in the soil, then we have to buy in nutrients. We've got to buy in phosphorus or potassium or nitrogen, whereas we can reduce those purchases or even eliminate them with just enhancing the organic matter level in the soil. Maybe we don't need irrigation or not as much irrigation. We, maybe we don't need a drainage system to get rid of excess water with just ex extra organic matter in the soil. So when we till the ground regularly, we're exposing the ground several times in the course of a year and it's loosening the structure that's in place. So if you make it vulnerable to a rainfall event and we have had more and more heavy rainfall events, that soil is not being held together by the roots of the plant and it can be washed away very easily. And every time you till the land, you're actually oxidizing that carbon and it's actually what's captured in the soil is going back into the atmosphere. So you have to depend more and more upon purchased fertilizers. Whereas if with organic matter, that's the equivalent of multiple bags of fertilizer as long as you have a viable live organic matter in the soil. We've destroyed a lot of the glues and the organic matter that are in our soils, our existing soils, by doing the tillage. So when we're doing the cover crops and doing the no-till, what we're trying to do is we're trying to reestablish the organic matter that's in the soils, the glomulin that's in the soils, which is basically the glue of the soils that holds these soils together, and to try and stop the sediment and nutrient runoff and also increase the infiltration in these soils here as well. The truth about adopting more sustainable agricultural practices, you know, through the use of biomimicry and increasing organic matter and biological life in your soil and reducing inputs, is that it, it can be done. It's, it's happening on farms. On our farm, we've been able to take some fields in as little as five years and increase the organic matter 1%. That equates to hundreds of thousands of gallons of water, additional water, that wasn't stored in those fields before being stored in those fields. That, for me as a farmer, means my crops drink that. That for me as a farmer in this community means that the water from my farm doesn't make it to the lake.
sustainability is a very broad term that has to do with everything people want, and lakes are one thing people want, particularly in Wisconsin, where we have 15,000 lakes. Part of sustainable agriculture is having sustainable waters. The two of them go together. This is an issue throughout the entire state of Wisconsin. If you happen to live in Dane County, then you know about Lake Mendota and Lake Monona, and you know that they turn green with algae virtually every summer. If you live in the central sands part of the state of Wisconsin, you know that those sandy soils will allow whatever is placed on them to permeate very quickly into the groundwater. You also know that extracting too much water for some of the larger agricultural operations has even resulted in a lowering of water levels in some of the lakes and drying up of some of the smaller streams and even rivers. This is Wolf Lake, a place where hundreds of Portage County residents might have used 20 years ago on a nice hot weekend here. The lake has been drawn so much by pumping here that this lake is no longer usable for fishing or swimming. The science here conclusively ties pumping to low uh, water levels in lakes and streams and aquifers. Wolf Lake here, as well as the other lakes, are attached to groundwater. You pump groundwater out for other purposes. Water levels go down, levels in lakes go down, flows in streams go down. This issue was already known in the 1960s or 1970s. By 2005, pumping had developed to a point where that during a very modest dry period, we saw uh, lakes disappearing and, and streams drying up. All waters are waters of the state. That means this Wolf Lake here, the Little Plover River, many of the other lakes and streams in central Wisconsin that have been impacted by pumping, they are something that all Wisconsinites have taken as a loss. The sustainability stool of, of social environment and economy has become unbalanced here, uh, cer certainly on the environmental side. Uh, might, others might argue also on the economic side here because lakes like this are the calling card for places like Portage County to get new business and young people to come in. And so for the last 11, 12 years, this has been at the forefront of a lot of discussion of water sustainability. Well, pretty much this whole region, the whole Central Sands is all irrigated. We couldn't be growing crops here without it. Uh, we have one of the most well-replenished aquifers in North America here. It, we, can't, we can't farm without it. Here we have some surface water issues on the divide, kind of between, that you can see maybe in the background, between where water rain would fall on this side would end up in the Mississippi River. If it fell two miles to our east, it would end up in Lake Michigan. And so there's some challenges along that area where, where they don't get a lot of runoff from rainfall. You know, right now this pumping impact is fairly localized to this area of 100 miles by 50 miles. And if you're a person that doesn't recreate on lakes and streams, you might not even see it when it's in your backyard. And so it's a local, very serious problem. It's spreading to other parts of the state, but it hasn't grown this politically critical mass. You know, the other thing about the central sand situation is that this is sort of a canary in the coal mine. The farming practices also have impacts on, on the water quality. Uh, the chief impact is, is nitrate pollution. There's a drinking water standard of 10, and it's very common to find 20, 30, 40 in the groundwater in this area. To a lesser degree, there's pesticide residues that come along with it. What we tell people is if you, if you have well water in, in Wisconsin, you should get it tested for nitrates. If you have high nitrate levels, then you should really consider getting it tested for pesticides. UW Stevens Point has a great groundwater resource center where people can look online, if you look up UW Stevens Point, and find out what wells were tested for in your area, and it kind of gives you an idea about what you want to pay to have your well tested for. Those of us that live out in the country, or even in a small town like Coloma, 450 people, um, certainly what we do on the farm has an effect on those people. But environmentally, through our work with the World Wildlife Fund and the UW, the practices we do are much more thoughtful, much more focused on their impacts than they would have been 20 years ago. There's about 100 different diseases and pests that potatoes are susceptible to, and potatoes are pretty intensively managed. We use integrated pest management. The sand is a great system. You put nutrients in, you get crops, nutrients out. 
Um, but it's also an incredibly efficient leaching system if you're not using nutrients or pesticides efficiently. So it's, it's not sustainable for us to be flushing nitrates into the groundwater. It's not, obviously we've paid for those nitrates and don't want to be doing that, but also it's not a very neighborly thing to do. So we spoon feed, which means we make lots of very small applications. We're very wary of the weather because if we put a bunch on and then we get an inch or two rainfall, it flushes through the system and then ends up in the groundwater. I think in the current time with emphasis on business and no regulation and what people perceive as creating lots of jobs are trumping whatever environmental concerns there are, no matter how modest. The old axiom is it's easier to argue about the science than to argue about the policy direction. So if we can argue and cast aspersions on, on the science and say it's doubtful, that's an easier thing to argue than saying, hey, pumping is drying up the lakes and streams. Should we continue drying up the lakes and streams or should we develop some management strategies? And a lot of times, frankly, it's easier for them to ignore the science or, or push it to the side because the science complicates the decision making. People are tricky creatures, the, the way we perceive things and the way that we act upon them. And the future is uncertain. Until something happens in the legislature, it's gonna be back to the Wild West days where we're gonna be permitting high capacity wells anytime pretty much that somebody wants them without regard to lake and stream health here. So I always look at, again, agriculture as oftentimes a bridge between uh, what happens uh, in nature and what happens with people. And when that bridge is strong, uh, both sides are healthy. When that bridge starts to break and crumble, both sides of that bridge start to have impacts. But you know, I hear farmers, mainstream farmers in the state, who say it's time. We ought to be responsible. We want to be held responsible. We are stewards and we're proud of our stewardship. We don't want to have bad actors contaminating the water and ruining our reputation. We are all in this together. And we have to realize that each one of us has our own separate strengths. So there's a lot of room for a lot of farming systems under the umbrella of sustainability. But what we need to do is identify the most significant goals that we're trying to achieve. And clearly it is to protect the, the waters of the state. Clearly it is to keep our soil in place. And clearly it is to raise healthy food. I am uh, so excited about the way agriculture is thinking about things, how the producers are, are looking at how they can make a, a profit and keep the soil on their land, keep the phosphorus on their land, that's good for them, and it's good for our waterways. One of the things that's been happening is we have a lot of farmers in the state in livestock and dairy that are very interested in finding new ways of handling and feeding their animals. A lot of them are trying managed grazing. Uh, the managed grazing programs are designed to allow a person to you know, raise uh, either uh, milk or beef off an acreage and do it in a way that from an environmental standpoint really has no impact. A well-managed pasture, the manure stays on the pasture, there's no herbicide, pesticide runoff, there's no soil erosion, and so many of the issues that, as a biologist, I would have had with a conventional ag systems pretty much disappear with a, with a grazing system. The grazing community is not only a way for people to maintain, a, make a living at it, but it's also a way to fundamentally rebuild the rural community, which in my mind is, uh, has been suffering a long time since the, since the 1970s. For 30 years, the foundation of our farm has been grazing. So it's not the same as my grandparents when they were grazing. I think they were building barbed wire fences.
50 years ago, New Zealanders were developing a low impedance energizer that was able to transmit electricity on fencers and being able to do a better job of containing those animals, not to mention the, the portable reels and the poly wires so that we can change fences more often, being able to handle a larger number of animals, being able to move them frequently and actually utilize the pasture better. We know that cattle do best when they harvest fresh pasture. An old friend of mine, he said years ago, there's two things always happen when you cut hay. One, it's costing you money. Two, it'll never get any better than when you cut it. So when cows graze, it's always the best quality that is possible. And it doesn't cost that much money because the cattle know how to harvest it. We don't have to handle any of their manure. It's being deposited back on the land. And when I see a cow pie, I think of all the bacteria that's in there. I'm thinking all the food stuff that's being regenerated in the organic matter. I think of beetles and earthworms that are going to feed upon that and supply other nutrients so that they can break it down and it's the circle of life. Managed grazing is what really brought us here. That was the most sustainable way for us to get started farming from an economic and an environmental standpoint. So in essence, our cows do a lot of our work through the growing season. Plants have roots, cows have legs. Send them out to do what they're naturally supposed to do for millions of years on this earth and go out and graze good, high quality forages. Uh, basically harvesting their own feed and bringing milk back to the barn. So as agriculture progresses, our farms have gotten larger and larger. And when farms get that large, it's very difficult for a new farmer to enter into it. Uh, it's just plain you cannot afford to do this. Uh, one of the benefits of managed grazing is it is the perfect inlet for beginning farmers. In Wisconsin, we lose 500 dairy farmers a year. That's just dairy farmers. So we really need to be looking at this, not only as an egg industry, but as a rural community and a consumer. It's important that they're there and that they stay. So in addition to that 3,000 cow dairy or that 5,000 cow dairy, we should also have 30 independent 100 cow dairies. The sustainability of our actual dairy industry takes all of them. And, and trying to understand how the ecosystem works naturally, that's the measurement that we should be shooting for. You know, you think about on the plains where, where we have great soil and a lot of organic matter. And what grew that soil, what made that soil, and what made all that organic matter was the grass growing and then the animals grazing it. The role of the ruminant animal is to take low energy forage and convert it into a higher energy product like meat or milk. The free energy we can get is from the sun, right? All this grass here that can absorb that sunlight, use a photosynthesis, process it, and grow forage. And I think then that's where the, the cow comes in. That ruminant animal can take that forage. That's what she's built to do. She's not built to digest grain. She's built to digest forage. Eats a lot of it and converts it into meat and milk. So they're storing energy. You can almost think about the cow as being a battery for energy and how we could store more energy on this earth just with the cows. It's kind of an interesting thought. When you see the cattle out here as they get to fulfill their role on this earth. And I think it's really important that versus the confinement lot where, okay, well, we're just gonna use you, we're gonna use you as a thing, you're gonna produce milk for us, and that's all you are. I think you have to have a respect for what the animal is. I'm not just saying this to fluff for your film, it's. I think it's part of what I, I really do believe here um, and, and, and why I'm doing what I'm doing. It feels good, it feels right to, to farm this way. Sustainable agriculture can mean a thousand things, but let's talk about one of the biggies, and that's that 500-pound gorilla out in the field. It smells like manure. The manure. A lot of manure. Nutrient outfall. Organic matter, or manure, as we would call it. Product that the cow, that we'll refer to as, as, as organic manure that comes out of the cow. Waste product. Manure can be a fantastic resource, and it can also be a fantastic problem. When you think about how many 
quadrillion gallons there are in the Great Lakes Basin and in the Bay of Green Bay. To be able to put enough nutrients in that water to cause what is happening here means we're putting in a very substantial amount. What's happening in this lake will impact everyone in Wisconsin most certainly. The growth in the size of dairy farms is a phenomenon that's occurring all over the world. Uh, CAFO is a farm that has more than a thousand animal units, uh, which works out to be about 750 milking cows. My grandfather milked about 45 cows. My dad milked around about 170 cows. The old saying years ago was, you never had more cows than what your wife could milk. That's no longer true today. We have decided to uh, uh, do more a little bit of on the volume side, which uh, some people think is good and some people don't think is good. And uh, we've taken it to about 3,500 cows and about 3,500 heifers. We had zero cows and we went to 4,000. And it's because if you try and grow, you always hit these walls where, oh, I did that wrong now, I did that wrong. Where there we optimize everything so it's efficient. In Wisconsin, uh, the result has been, uh, one could argue, more dairy cows in particular parts of the state than that ecosystem can accommodate. So when you have large animal operations, that, that risk of those nutrients being, being recycled, recirculated through the environment is just a bigger risk. It's not to say that it can't be done, but it takes uh, technology, it takes planning. Why do I think uh, large animal operations are so much in the spotlight right now? I think they're an easy target because people don't understand how they operate. Because they don't understand it, they fear it a little bit. They're large, people are a little fearful of large. So we have 8,000 cows, so maybe some people really view that we need to stay like we were in the past with small operations. And there's a place for that, but there's a place for large ones too, I believe. Sustainability versus domination. A CAFO is a form of domination economically, socially, and environmentally. But people view that as a, a, a metric of success. And so if you're thinking within that system, like if I can get this many cows in one space, that will be success, you're at odds with other systems. And increasingly, the legal system is taking notice. Especially the Wisconsin Supreme Court at the end of 2015 issued a ruling that indicates manure will be considered a pollutant if it contaminates a neighboring well. Each cow produces about as much waste as 18 humans, and if you have 1,000 or 5,000 cows at one spot, you can think that's a lot of animal waste that needs to be dealt with. We don't have the infrastructure at our farms like we do at our communities to uh, treat that waste, and often it's easiest to spread that manure near the place where it's generated. So quite frankly, I think you know, there's sort of a carrying capacity issue. Do we have enough land for the amount of manure that's uh, generated, particularly in this watershed that leads to Green Bay? So how do we handle our organic matter, or manure, as we would call it? First of all, it all gets collected and goes through a digester, anaerobic digesters in both dairies. So we make electricity with it. Um, then we separate the fiber from it. We'll dry that fiber for bedding for a cow. And then that liquid portion, we store. We have about 13 months storage, so we don't have to do any winter application, and we do a lot of summer application. We really try to put 75% of our nutrients on the plants while they're growing, rather than fall or spring, because that's when the roots are there to grab the nutrients. That's where the roots are there to hold soil from running off. An adult cow will produce about 30 gallons per day of a product that we call our organic manure. Their manure that then gets mixed with the water, getting it into more of a liquid fashion, which makes it easier for us to handle it at a larger volume. Between all of our sites, we produce about 40 million gallons of product, of the liquid product. And doesn't it just blow you away? We're mixing clean, potable water with manure? 
in a place a global awareness of water and how valuable it is and yet we are absolutely we must either have an arrogance about it or there must be such a glut of it which we do know we have here in this northeastern region of the state that it is actually abused. We then go through multiple stages of separation recycling the sand that's in it to be reused again, recycling the large particle fiber for multiple uses. After that process today, it is stored in our lagoons until it is time to be a field applied for the growing crops. A 20,000 gallon application per acre would be the equivalent of about two thirds of an inch of rain. Those would get applied in a one-time application is we incorporate all of our manure. Those are being applied for the crop that's gonna grow next spring, and we know that there are significant weather events, both in wet winter and in spring, that can affect whether that product and that soil stays in place. It's taken a long time for Kiwani County and some of our surrounding counties to come to grips with the problems we have here. Nature is sending us a very loud, strong, and clear wake-up call that it's time to act. We've talked about it, we've studied it, we're now very certain what is causing our problem. It is the hundreds of millions of gallons of liquid cattle manure that is being applied in vulnerable areas such as ours that's having the impact that it's having. Well, everybody wants to talk about manure runoff, which is considered a point source. That's not our big issue here. Our big issue is non-point runoff. I don't care whether it's a piece of parking lot, a piece of person's lawn, a golf course, or our agricultural field. There is non-point pollution that all washes to Lake Michigan on an everyday, regular basis. Every person has a, a piece of lawn that's putting stay green on there is a part of this issue. We're just the larger part of it, but we all have to do a better job Everybody that owns a piece of property, farmers just are bigger in that pedestal because of the volume of land that we have. So you don't have to be a scientist. All you have to be is an individual living in your community and recognizing that the major rivers that you have there are on the EPA's impaired water listing and that you have 34% of the tested wells are contaminated and cannot be used in the homesteads where they're at. A USDA researcher has has called our water that that he would have expected to find in a third world country. And of course that has literally meant that some people have gotten sick. So the manure was able to penetrate through the very shallow soils into the bedrock, through the sinkhole, and enter into the groundwater stream quickly. Within a matter of a day or two, 16 separate families became ill and one child was hospitalized because they were drinking the contaminated water. Now in Kewanee County, there have, there have been kids who've been exposed to this bacteria, E. coli O157. And this bacteria can be deadly. It not only can, people can die from the bacteria, but they often, kids often get kidney failure from it. Something, a disease called hemolytic uremic syndrome. We've had our local high school set up a clean water kiosk to allow families to come to the high school and receive free bottles of water so that they can sustain themselves in their homes. We know scientifically that we've gone beyond the carrying capacity of our land. We know that it's running off into our rivers, it's going into our groundwater. I think we need to start to really have a common sense discussion about our agricultural system. You know, what is it that's going to be the balance between agriculture and our water, agriculture and our health for our citizens? It's not about the farmer or farming as a system. It's about those people that choose to actually do those practices that are gonna harm our environment. There's nobody that says that you have to put on 16,000 gallons per acre right next to a waterway. Water just doesn't show up in your tap. It's coming from a source. But I'm sure if most people in Green Bay were asked, they would not know that their water was coming from the Kiwani area. The, the message is not that we need to be anti-agriculture. 
We can't exist without today's agriculture. Let's face it, we need a healthy agricultural industry. The message is that we need a change in the agricultural models, especially in areas that have the vulnerable geology that we do. And that's really what we're talking about here. People would be outraged if we dumped large amounts of human waste into Wisconsin lakes. We need to get to the same point with livestock, where we realize it's not a great idea. We can't deny that our water quality is going down. It's a scientific fact. Farmers are now committing to be a part of it. They've even indicated that they recognize that they're part of the problems, and that is a huge step. We have to start looking at other tools that revolve around permanent ground cover and soil loss. We can't be status quo and say what we did before is, is, is good enough. We have to continue to get better. Where it used to be commodity based, now all of a sudden we're talking about maybe these priorities need to be environmentally based. That sense is now shared by those in our DNR and DATCAP and also the EPA. We all have a part in this. It's just that agriculture offers this golden opportunity. But we need some really talented conservation staff, good agronomy staff that can build a relationship with a farmer, which could be beneficial to them and us and the water. It isn't that we have a manure problem. I believe that it's more we have a water problem. We need to take the water out of the manure and make two more concentrated manure products that, that we can apply when the crop is growing. To get this liquid out, we're gonna need some form of ultrafiltration. We're gonna need some sort of reverse osmosis. Some people do think science is a simple solution, and a lot of people are working on better technology for controlling phosphorus, but we're not there yet, and the technology we have now is pretty expensive. It's like providing sewage treatment for cows. We don't need to be using water to flush down barns. You know, nowhere in nature do any animals all stop and defecate in one big hole in the ground, other than man. And unfortunately, now we've made it so the cows do. These new technologies, all they're doing is dealing with the symptom of a broken system. You know, we need to go back to ground zero and start to look at how is it done in nature and how can we replicate that. There are technologies that have been proposed to concentrate nutrients in the manure in order that it can be moved off the farm. From an ecological standpoint, that disrupts that whole nutrient balance. Now we've broken the cycle of the dairy ecosystem. As a society and as industry, we value a crop by how many bushels and what the value of that bushels are. Pounds of milk and what the value is. We never subtract the environmental impact so if we had an actual dollar figure that was associated with every pound of phosphorus and we really subtracted that off, now we're truly going to figure out the economic impact of our different agricultural systems. And once we figure out the true economic impact, our more sustainable agricultural management systems will rise to the top and it'll give the consumer, it'll give the agency people and our whole population in general what it wants get everybody together and say, we're gonna pay for a balanced phosphorus budget. We're gonna figure out how to get our phosphorus budget in balance so we're not overloading the soils and therefore overloading the water. Then we're gonna do whatever it takes. We're gonna treat manure, develop crops that are really good at drawing the phosphorus out of soils, and work with farmers to make these technologies available across the landscape that don't pollute the environment that they use. The consumer is educated. We maybe need to listen to them and give them what they want, not tell them what they want. Not only from a product standpoint, but actually from a production standpoint. What can the public do to encourage sustainability? Just because you live in a huge apartment complex doesn't mean you're not an ecological citizen. Doesn't mean you don't have a role, an important place in 
the search for sustainability. We all eat. We all are responsible for the, the fact that, that they're providing us with food. Actually, any individual watching this film you know, can be part of making this change to a more sustainable agriculture system just by simply making a food choice, voting with your wallet three times a day. They can be as much a part of the change as the farmer and the tractor. Farmers in this country will grow what people want. Farmers in this country will grow what people demand. It's been being done since the dawn of agriculture. So it's really consumers becoming more ecological eaters that are driving the agricultural sustainability movement. One of the things consumers can do is to get to know where your food comes from and support food that is produced the way you want it produced. And this is where you have to do your homework because all the, the big companies that are selling food are going to claim a certain degree of sustainability. The average person can make a difference by what they eat and what they buy. Their dollar is actually the final vote on what it is they value. Make the right choices for what's right for all of us. Not only good for your health, but also good for our environment. Is it, is it impacting other people's lives? Uh, it is sort of like thinking in two different realms, one personal and one relational. And I think that's really gonna be the driving force in all of this is, it's not gonna be our government, it's not gonna be the food industry, it's gonna be the consumers and especially young mothers that are demanding for their children that they get clean, healthy food. They have a list of questions because they're educated. They know what's taking place. Because if you ask those questions, you're going to ask questions about sustainability and you're going to help create a system of not only sustainability, but food sovereignty. So local democratic control of food systems. They're choosing sustainable agriculture. They're choosing organics. That genie is out of the bottle. I think it's important that the public realize that we have really cheap food in the United States, it's really abundant, and producing that food on the cheap involves some pollution. If people don't like their lake polluted, they need to be willing to pay for food that's produced in a non-polluting way. So joining a CSA is a really easy way for people to commit to a farm in a way that's different than a traditional market relationship. Shop at the farmer's market. You also can make sure that this issue is spoken to by people whom you elect for public office. So there's certainly a reason for hope. Uh, we haven't ruined the planet yet. So I really encourage people to think about what it is that gives them meaning in their relationships and in their lives and to put that up against what the material requirements of those are. And so if we can rethink the material needs to give us meaning and happiness and fulfillment, it can really reshape the whole discussion about sustainability. With any relationship, you need to give back in order for it to last. That lake has got all kinds of ability to clean itself. We need to give back to our lakes. We need to give back to our rivers. There's ways to do it. It's not hopeless. And we'll have some clean lakes that our grandchildren will thank us for. Funding for this program was provided by